Hello everyone and welcome to uh, our first critical conversation of uh, the new academic year, which is very exciting indeed. Um, my name's Ailey, I'm Assistant Learning and Access Curator with the University Museums and I'm going to be chairing the panel this evening. So tonight we're going to be talking all about a very special uh, object that is coming to St Andrews in a couple of weeks time, uh, coming from the British Library as part of their Treasures on Tour programme and which is funded by the Helen Hamlin Trust and it's uh, John Harding's map of Scotland and we're going to be uh, finding out a whole lot more about it this evening. Um, so just as a little bit of housekeeping, uh, if you click the three dots on your screen, you can turn on your uh, closed captioning or subtitles for this evening. Um, and there's also a Q&A function. So if you would like to submit questions to any of our panelists this evening, um, please feel free to do that. Uh, I will be uh, keeping everybody uh, reminded of that function as the evening goes on. So please, please send us your questions. We'd love to answer them. Um, so I think what I'll do first is I will pass on to our panellists to introduce themselves and a little bit about their research and their interest in uh, in the area that we're, we're talking tonight, talking about tonight, which is all about how the Harding map um, can help us discuss the very contemporary issue of Scottish independence. So I'll pass on first to Professor Michael Brown from the School of History, who is an expert uh, on all things uh, medieval Scotland and specifically uh, the Harding map. Hi, I'm Michael Brown and I'm Professor of Scottish History at St Andrews. And as Ailey said, I'm uh, a late medievalist and my interests are on the Kingdom of Scotland uh, between about 1200 and 1500 and in particular its place in the wider world um, in the British Isles, its relations with the other parts of the islands and in Europe as well. And I, I published on um, James the I, uh, the Black Douglases and a history of the British Isles in the late Middle Ages. That's great. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, and I'll pass over now to uh, Daniel. Good evening, everyone. I'm Daniel Lever. I'm a PhD candidate in the School of History. Um, I'll be coming at this evening's topic from a more, uh, more contemporary angle. My PhD is on modern British history. I'm studying uh, the sort of political implications of North Sea oil in 1960s and 1970s Britain. So uh, my work's on uh, things like um, it, uh, oil's place in uh, science and technology policy, economic modernisation, um, the role of the state in the economy, uh, industrial relations and also constitutional questions. So all those big debates of that period. And following on from that more broadly, um, I'm, I'd say I'm mostly interested in 20th century British politics. So particularly issues like constitutional change, devolution and nationalism, and really just trying to understand why our, our political leaders believe what they do about all these issues and getting, trying to unpick some of those questions. Amazing, thank you so much, Daniel. So as you can see, we have uh, representatives from a broad, a broad spectrum of uh, interest in Scottish history this evening, which I think will make for a very interesting discussion. I think what would be fantastic for everybody who's tuning in at home to start with, uh, Michael, if you are willing, is to give us a little bit of a, a bit of a background to the Harding map um, and why it, why it is such an interesting uh, object. <laughs> Thanks, Ailey. Yeah, I, I, it is a unique um, and really striking image if you can see it on your screen. It, it, it's brightly coloured, it's meant to draw the eye. And what must be obvious to anybody looking at it, it it's meant as an illustration rather than as an aid to navigation. Um, it's at a period when uh, navigational maps are becoming increasingly common, but this isn't really one of them. Um, it sits in um, John Harding's Chronicles, who's written a history book of um, England with a particular interest in England's relations with Scotland. And this is kind of an eye catching uh, illustration that he's placed in it alongside what is perhaps the real navigational aid, which is an itinerary. So 
people are uh, being invited to navigate their way around Scotland, um, but by the written word rather than the, the pictorial form that we kind of think of as, as, as the principal navigational tool. So it, it's something which is, I guess, typically medieval in lots of ways, but it's showing people thinking about um, geographical space um, in a written way, but wanting to illustrate it as well. And it, it's part of Harding's sales pitch. Harding is a, is a, a fascinating character. We know quite a lot about him, but it's all from what he tells us really. And he's not the most trustworthy narrator. Um, what he claims is he's a, he's a man in old age and he's in retirement in a monastery. And what he wants is um, the financial rewards that he thinks are owed to him by the kings of England. Um, he claims he's been sent to Scotland by Henry V um, in about 1419, 1420 um, and has suffered injury and financial loss. Um, he may go back to Scotland about a decade later as well. And he claims that he's been promised an estate for this and it's never been delivered to him. So on a number of occasions, he presents his kind of bill to various English royal officials and gets nowhere. So in the 14, late 1440s or 1450s, um, as an enterprising man, he starts writing this chronicle really as a way of, of kind of proving that he's owed something. Um, and the idea is this book is, is written for the English king, Henry VI. We don't think Henry ever sees it. Um, and it incorporates a lot of the information and evidence that Harding claims he's found in Scotland and brought back as proof that Scotland essentially belongs to the kings of England. And I think it's quite plausible that he's putting this map in there to show to the English king what a great prize Scotland would be. Um, his second motive is that England is descending into civil war in the late 1450s, the Wars of the Roses. And he thinks that a war against the national enemy, Scotland, would unite the English against him. He's a, he's a Northumbrian, he's from the northeast of England. So he's, he's a man who's grown up in the wars against Scotland and, and he knows that they're untrustworthy, they're rebels and they're people who deserve to be conquered and he's, he's kind of presenting this as a, a kind of manifesto um, to persuade the English government to, to renew the war against the Scots. Thank you very much. That was a very um, comprehensive introduction. Okay. To, uh, the Harding map. I think um, one of the really interesting things there is that this, like you say, this is definitely a sales pitch, isn't it? When you look at this map, and you can look at the map um, in the in the chat, um, you see that Scotland is this beautiful, bountiful land. You know, the churches have steeples that reach to the skies, and and the, there are high defensive walls and you know it's it's really presented as this place that wow there there are, there are so many opportunities here for, for us if if this is something we we pursue i think what's really interesting when looking at the at the map physically is this real distinction between the highlands and the lowlands of Scotland, because we say that, you know, this is a, a, a land of bounty, etc. But really, it's concentrated in in the lowland area, isn't it? The highlands on that map are just some trees, really, let's be honest. Um, Daniel, I think it'd be really interesting to get your perspective on this and how this kind of plays into uh, narratives moving forward as well. Sorry, Ailey, do you mean on on the um, Highland Lowland divide or the, the 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 map more generally? Apologies. Yeah, on the Highland Lowland divide, Highland. I think it's really interesting because it's clearly something that sort of the seeds of that are are already very clear. Um, sure. Yeah. So, map. I mean, Michael will tell you a lot more about this than me, but this is a period as well, the fifteenth century, um, the sort of early Stuart kings of Scotland one of their big priorities is expanding the crown's rate if you like into the highlands and um, sort of extending royal authority over the more remote parts of the country you know obviously we're, we're, we're talking about late, late medieval context in terms of logistics travel all those things so that that's a big policy of the crown to sort of push out into the highlands into the islands and the, you know there's you know we can we could go on all night about sort of various um you know 
battles, etc., that, that have been fought, that were fought to do this. But the, the point I would kind of make is Scotland in this, in the period that we're talking about, about tonight, isn't necessarily the, the more or less cohesive entity that we um, that we think of today. So to give an example, um, or the Orkney and Shetland Isles um, only really become part of Scotland at about this time, I believe. They sort of come as a, 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 a dowry payment for one of the for, for the marriage of one of the Stuart monarchs. And you know, you, you can still obviously, obviously see those um, those Norse influences in those those parts of Scotland today. So. Scotland in this period is not necessarily the same entity that we we think of today. There is this this divide, this Highland Lowland divide that they speak different languages. Um, yeah, so that is a big part of this process. I don't say into our our list of viewers tonight. Yeah, Scot this isn't necessarily the same entity called Scotland as we would as we would understand it today necessarily. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that context. Michael, I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah, I mean, I think Daniel's right. Um, I think it might also be to do with what Harding knows. So the parts of Scotland he's likely to have visited will be the south and the east coast. It, that tends to be where uh, Scotland's kings reside. Um, so he's he's looking at those areas and, and you know, his his uh, his navigation, uh, his itinerary through Scotland is really situated on moving between centres in that area. And previous English itineraries um, have concentrated on the same area. And I think partly it's because what they're writing are routes for armies. So it's it's a plan of conquest for Scotland. You know, we were talking about this being a sort of military uh, goal. And he may be using an itinerary that's written for one of Edward I's campaigns in Scotland in the 1290s, and that goes up the East Coast. And he's kind of following that route. And it's also the fact that if you're looking for major urban centres and uh, castles, for example, the things that he likes to pick and large cathedrals, um, then again, it's those parts of Scotland that, that um, I suppose, present those if you like, European style centres of power. Gaelic Scotland has a different structure and a different kind of uh, way of doing things. Um, it's it's not powerless. It's not on the defensive in the 15th century, um, but it is. And it's not entirely hostile to royal government either. It's not all about conflict. It is also for significant parts of the Central Highlands about cohabitation as well and just playing by slightly different rules, as, as Daniel was saying. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And I think it's quite interesting, isn't it, that we, you know, can see Scotland as a very separate entity in itself um, in this map, can't we? It should be should be said that this is what we believe to be the first topographical map of Scotland, which is, um, a, you know, a map that actually shows sort of geographical <clears throat> features of, the, of a place. Um, and I think it, it it is interesting, isn't it, to see a map of Scotland that's not just tacked on to to England, uh, you know, especially at this point in time. Um, this, like we say, it's the first time that this has happened. And I don't know, um, you know, whether that's a, a, a deliberate decision on Harding's part to present it as an entirely separate entity, as one that we should conquer. But actually, it really kind of... Um, it emphasises that unique Scottish identity that is something that comes up again and again when when discussing the independence of Scotland. Um, it would be interesting, Michael, to hear what what your thoughts are. I think you know we touched a little bit on, didn't we? What um, what Harding thought of Scotland? <laughs> yes, it's uh, it's almost a kind of catch twenty two because what what Harding is arguing. He, he, he's arguing that Scotland should be under the rule of the English king um, and he, he forges documents which suggest a historical precedent for that um, as part of his portfolio, if you like. But he needs Scotland to be a separate thing and a target for his argument to work. But as you say, Ailey, by doing that, he's giving us a kind of freestanding map of Scotland as a separate part of the world. And it's interesting that earlier maps from the 13th and 14th century are of the island of Britain. 
um, and some of them seem to be quite deliberately avoiding naming different parts of the island, um, so suggesting it's a single entity uh, and playing into that idea of the English kings as being the heirs of the kings of Britain, who are a kind of mythical body like King Arthur and people like that, um, who are very popular as, 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 as focal points of, of identity in the later Middle Ages. So, so Harding's kind of not exactly an own goal because what he wants is to show Scotland is an attractive target, um, but he is he is making a kind of contradictory point. You're right. Daniel, I don't know if you want to speak to this in that, you know, I think it's it's something that comes up again and again, isn't it? Scotland as a unique place and unique kingdom that has its own traditions, its own culture, its own identity. Um, that's obviously something that, that tracks through uh, up to the present day. Yeah, very much so. Um, what Michael said there, obviously, about that, that sort of what we may call the English view of the kings of England as the heirs of Brutus and therefore the, the rightful sort of dominance, if you like, of the, the whole islands. Unsurprisingly, that's never that's never been accepted by the Scots. So, you know, you, again, I could we could go on all night about it, but you do see some rather ingenious attempts by the Scots to sort of counter this narrative. They obviously develop their own narratives, which prove Scotland was an ancient ind independent kingdom, essentially. But I do think if you if you if you go if you go a bit forward into the future, what you kind of get, and this is this is maybe something that comes into play a bit more once we get to the Union of the Crowns in 1603 and the then the Union of the Parliaments in 1707. What you get, and this is sometimes forgotten a little bit in the contemporary debate, I think, is that the idea of England, England and Scotland uniting as equal partners, excuse me, is in many ways a counter to this narrative that Michael's talked about, because what you have, and um, you, not only a few decades after the period we're talking about tonight, you start to see writers in Scotland advocating for a, a union between the two kingdoms. And what they kind of see that as doing is that if they unite on equal terms in, in, in this enterprise, Scotland can preserve its national identity, its um, its distinctive institutions, its traditions, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, rather than being subsumed as, as, a, as, a, as a conquered entity into a, a greater England, if you like, if, if the English get their own way so there's that weird there's that weird dichotomy in the union i would argue and it, i think you can trace that back very much to the to the narratives that we're that we're talking about tonight yeah I, that that's fascinating and in a way you know what harding is proposing and the the, the model for relations between the two kingdoms in the, the 15th century, but you know, even well into the 16th century, is one where um, incorporation will come through some level of, of English force, English coercion, um, and it's almost, you know, it's, it's a kind of surprise that that doesn't happen. I think probably to both sides that quite rapidly in the late 16th century you get, for dynastic reasons, you know, the fact that that James the Sixth is the really kind of last significant surviving uh, grandson great-grandson of Henry Henry the seventh so he's a you know he's a claimant to the English English throne um, you know if any of those Tudors have children if they do their duty as kings if you know uh, Mary Elizabeth and Edward the sixth all fail terribly in the the, the propagation of, of heirs to continue their dynasty it's their failure that brings James the sixth to the to the English throne and if you told a Scot that in 1450 he'd think it was hilarious um, that the Scots had actually inherited England. You know, they make facetious claims about that um, in the 15th century because they claim, well, we're descended from the old Anglo-Saxon kings through St. Margaret. And so we're actually the heirs to Britain, not not the the, the, the descendants of William the Bastard, the Conqueror. Um, so they're doing that, but they do that to annoy the English. I mean, that's that's kind of basic role of the Scots in the late Middle Ages. And, and for it to actually come to pass, I think would be seen as something which was a huge joke. Um, in, in the, the 15th century. And uh, and let's face it, those people, the descendants of those people, make a huge amount of money out of the Union after 1603. They all traipsed down with James VI and 
pick up English wives and English estates and have a lovely time. So, you know, for, for the aristocracy of Scotland, who you know, spent their the, 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 the sort of dynastic development is all about fighting the English by 1603. It's like, OK, well, we'll cash that in and, and, and see what we can make out of it. So it is a very different kind of union, different kind of relationship to one that was really envisaged in the Middle Ages, I think, or in the late Middle Ages. I think that's a really good point, isn't it? I think we um, I think we think of Harding as this very sort of calculated uh, sort of uh, guy who thinks that, you know, Scotland's going to come under English rule if you follow my steps. You know, I've given you this massive chronicle. It gives you places that your army can camp exactly where you should pull your fleet up to, to get to get to the biggest cathedral in Scotland and that kind of thing. Yeah, he, he might be quite disappointed that, <laughs> that Scotland, um, you know, uh, becomes part of England in the way that it does, which is which is really quite interesting. And something that you um, mentioned, Daniel, is this idea of this relationship between England and Scotland being one of very, very much one of a of a balancing act. And if this sort of if the scales tip too far one way or the other in whatever way that may be, that's when the union really comes into trouble, I, th I think. Um, and clearly this is something that, you know, uh, is happening at this point in time in, in the later Middle Ages, but something that presumably we can see uh, throughout the course of uh, the early modern into the modern period. Yeah, very much so. So to sort of pick up the story briefly after after James the Sixth and First, obviously he's succeeded by his well his younger son actually Charles the First, his his elder son uh, predeceases his father. Charles the First, obviously the the beginning of his troubles is trying to impose essentially English Anglican high church religious practices on a Presbyterian country in Scotland and. The Scots again don't want that, so it, it's that idea of um, yeah, um, a, 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 as you say, that sort of balance sort of both both sort of national traditions needing to be you know respected or accommodated, if you like. Um, obviously, and again at the end of the sixteenth, uh, the seventeenth century, I beg your pardon, when we're kind of getting to the point of uh, the of the Union of seventeen oh seven. One of the big Scottish motivations is that they don't have access to English overseas imperial markets. That even though you know, even though these countries have the same have the same monarch in William the Third and Second and later Queen Anne, Scotland doesn't have access to the same resources, if you like, that England does. So yeah, certainly in the certainly in the early modern period, you can you can definitely see that balance, and that's probably what leads to seventeen oh seven. I'd argue. Um, and yeah, I'm sure we can kind of we can see some, you know, contemporary resonances in the into the into the 19th and 20th centuries as well. And I think what it reflects is one of the fundamental questions we have to answer in all this is how do you make England and Scotland equal partners when one's 10 times the size of the other, got 10 times the population of the other, 10 times the resources of the of the other? How, you know, how do you do that? And it's, you know, well, I'll leave the viewers to form their own answers about whether we've, you know, whether anyone's been able to answer that question successfully. Uh, I, I mean, I think that's a really interesting point. And, you know, uh, going sort of linking that to Harding, I think it's also the balance between uh, a relationship which is seen as coercive or has a coercive element to it and one which is, um, I suppose, more negotiated. And in a way, you can almost see a sort of, you know, a modern democratic culture of a unitary state as being part of the problem. And, you know, Daniel's presenting is a problem of numbers. You know, the, the disparity in population size has grown considerably since 1707. Um, and it means that in terms of influence on uh, events in a, in a, U, at a UK level, Scotland clearly feels that it has less than it needs. Um, and that's I guess that's where devolution comes in. And the you know the 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 balance between uh, a government in Westminster which is elected on English votes 
imposing policies or imposing certain policies on Scotland is has been for the last 50 years, I think, quite problematic. Um, and it, it, it isn't, but may feel like that kind of level of coercion or some kind of coercion politically, um, which has been, as Daniel said, you know, the, the root of, of, of friction between England and Scotland, um, well, since the 17th century, if, if not longer. Yeah, no, I think that's it's really um, it's just so complex <laughs> as as with all of these things, you know, we could we could sit here and talk to the cows come home, I imagine, about all the different intricacies that have formed the current political situation that Scotland and England find themselves in. I think what would be really interesting to uh, hear from you both is a bit about how we as a museum or museums go about presenting these issues in in our exhibitions in our in our displays because you know it's we I think as people who engage with issues of history there's obviously uh, a desire to not uh, make any sort of teleological narratives like oh it was all leading up to this point and that's why we're here now so there is a danger when you say Let's use the Harding map to talk about Scottish independence. You know, how 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 do we how do we make that uh, a story that's relevant for audiences, but that also acknowledges how many different factors feed into you know a, a, a contemporary discussion like today. I think that's really interesting. Um, and it's the kind of problems I think that historians face as well in a rather different sense. Um, I think, I mean, I think you can approach from different angles. So one thing you could say about Harding is he's a classic example of someone who thinks you've got domestic problems, let's have a foreign war as a solution, um, which is always a rather flawed, um, you know, proposal, prospectus. Um, so you, you can take it out of the Anglo-Scottish scenario and think of it in terms of, um, someone who's writing a manifesto pursuing a particular foreign policy path and you know we might think about Iraq in 2003 and the way in which you know wars are, uh, are presented to the public by people with influence or information in this case it's someone a, a kind of foreign policy expert trying to persuade the government to act in a certain way so you, you could take that angle on it rather than using it in terms of uh, Scottish independence. I think, you know, I think some of the things we've been talking about suggest ways to me that we could link it to the independence debate, but Daniel's more au fait with the kind of history of recent debates on that. I wonder if he has any ideas on that. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a very interesting question as certainly as you know, and as someone who's not from a museums or galleries or collections background as well. Um, I think an important thing as as a as a museum is it's nice to kind of you know assume a sort of a level of knowledge and interest among your among your audience um, among it well any museum's audience I'd argue if you know if people are coming to see this they obviously have well well they might just be coming to get out of the rain you never know but um, you know you'd assume if someone's going to a museum they'd have some interest in the topic that's that's being ex exhibited so i think it's quite important to assume that level of knowledge and interest in in the visitor and kind of allow in some ways allow them to make their own connections to you know whatever contemporary debate it might be so as, as michael said sort of contemporary foreign policy issues or the the scottish independence debate today so now you know, how you do that is perhaps another question, but that would be my my sort of two penneth worth on on that particular issue. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it, it's also about knowledge and understanding, I think, as well, because what you're you're dealing with is someone who is representing and almost translating his his apparent experience of Scotland for a non Scottish audience. Um, and medieval travellers texts are, are always deeply uh, problematic um, because they're quite often written from armchairs not very far away from where the readers are, are operating. 
um and and so we we have to to read them with a pinch of salt i guess um so you know harding is depicting scotland in a particular way and the places he chooses i think are quite interesting as well you know he's he's picking particular centers some of which we might expect like edinburgh and st andrews some of which are perhaps slightly more surprising like dune for example the castle of dune in mentis the way he depicts Dumbarton and his physical description of Dumbarton makes it sound like some huge fortress. Um, you know, there's not a lot of the medieval castle of Dumbarton left. So that's a really interesting clue. Um, so it's also a kind of in a traveler's tales genre and a depiction of, of the way in which people from, you know, who don't travel receive information in the medieval period. And I think that's another angle that, that a museum might might pick up upon. Daniel, I think there was maybe something that you wanted to add to that uh, before I jump away. <laughs> yeah, just um, just one of the one of the points that just kind of came to me as well from what Michael was saying there. Um, you know, it, it's important to remember this is you know a map as well, so there's something you can maybe tell from a, a sort of cartography perspective as well. You know, the you know if we you know well, the viewers have got the map to to kind of see, and you know you can. You can maybe place that in the the context of the development of cartography as a discipline. I mean, you know, once you've got Harding, you've kind of okay, you've got the kind of basic geography. You know, you've got you know Edinburgh in the southeast, St Andrews above it. You've got the, you know, the table of that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's still it's still obviously quite a you know a, a, a basic sort of diagram almost of Scotland, isn't it? You know, and if we think about you know certainly by the by the seventeenth century, the um, once you get to a, a, a chap called Blau, the the Blau Atlas of Scotland, you've got a much more you know a, a much more geographically accurate map that's being produced. So you can kind of, you know you can see the de, you know the development of that particular discipline, I think, and I think the Harding map is perhaps a, a good way to to introduce a conversation about that. I think that's really interesting um, because you you what you get in the, the 16th and 17th century there's a sort of precursor called Timothy Pont who's a, a Scot who who surveys Scotland so he actually you know we have his notes and we have his kind of rough drawings he never completes his his mapping exercise but he's actually going and walking the land and you can see him he's, he sketches the buildings into his map and in a way it's a much it's a much uglier, sort of tattier thing, but it's uh, it, it, it's that's real cartography as opposed to what Harding is doing, which I think is illustrating in a way. It, it's fascinating. I mean, which is what mapping is in a lot of medieval senses. It's a way of telling a story by drawing something, you know, as we would say, you know, to say in, in a picture. So he's thinking very much of that school in the way that previous chroniclers have done too. Um, but there is a kind of growing tradition of using these as as actual tools for getting about. And certainly you're getting um, maritime charts being drawn by people from Catalonia or from northern Italy um, for the Mediterranean. And then they're kind of creeping around the Bay of Biscay and then into the channel and slowly up the east coast. Um, they tend to show kind of Scotland as a blob on the top of a quite nicely drawn east coast of England. Um, they probably go as far as Berwick and Leith, but they don't really go much further than that so um, in terms of their drawings that's as far as they get um, so it, it is about kind of cultural intellectual change and it's also about sort of professional navigators as well um, but yeah I think that would be that would be another thing you could get from from Harding placing him in that history of of map making as Daniel said um, but I wonder if you know thinking back to that issue that you kind of dangled in front of us Ailey about Scottish independence which is you know, this is about a past in which Scotland is a distinct kingdom. And I suppose the, the way in which Harding is representing it and the effort he's putting into the kind of telling a story about Scotland escaping from English subjection is quite different from the way the Scots talk about themselves, which is that, you know, they, they buy the 1450s, it's it's been over a century since serious English attempts to impose that um, authority on them. 
and they're quite confident and comfortable in their separation from England and their direct connections with the Low Countries for Trade and with the Kingdom of France, for example, as a, as a political and military ally. And the stories they tell are about that history. So in, in a sense, you can counterpoint two separate narratives, which interestingly, and this is something Daniel might come back to, you know, after the union, the efforts that are put in to kind of merge those narratives are really quite interesting. I don't know if you have anything you, you'd like to say on that, Daniel, the way in which the kind of English and Scottish stories are merged into some kind of British narrative by quite strenuous efforts. Yeah, I mean, certainly the, the, the that that process isn't uh, isn't an overnight one. I mean, you know, you think about things like the the um, the, the Jacobite rebellion, certainly the, the the famous one, 1745, Bonnie Prince Charlie, and all the rest of it. You can quite clearly see there that a section of Scottish society has has not accepted this new British entity, this this Great Britain that that has been created, but. Um, I think one of the big things that happens almost contempor contemporaneously with with the union is the development of, of of what becomes the British Empire and the idea of empire as a, as a, as a, a shared British enterprise, if you like, and that's obviously one which you know um, for, for for better or worse gives you know Scots play an outsized role in. If, you know, if you think about um, Scot, uh, Scots in, in India, for instance, during the imperial period, um, Canada, New Zealand, many, many other parts of the empire, the Scots do, as I say, play a, dis a disproportionate role in empire. So it's, yeah, I, I'd argue empire is some empire in a sense of, of, of shared Protestantism as well, which I think is an important factor after, after, um, after the mid 16th century the idea that both of these kingdoms are protestants in a largely catholic western europe so those those two things i would uh, you can make an argument that many people have are the kind of glue in this this shared british narrative if you like and it's probably not a coincidence well it it, it it almost certainly isn't a coincidence that once we get to after the you know after the Second World War, decolonization, secu the secularization of British society as well, that British narrative kind of falls apart a little bit and starts to be starts to be challenged more, not just in Scotland, but also you know you have the departure of Ireland from the United Kingdom after the after the First World War. Um, and perhaps in more in more recent years, a sort of growing assertion of Englishness in England as well. So you've got all those different factors at play, I'd argue, in first the sort of construction of this this shared British narrative. And then you can see them coming apart and that narrative perhaps being a bit more challenged in, in, in recent times. I think that's really interesting, actually. And the, the thing that stuck out there when you were speaking is this idea of, you know, Scotland played such a, a clear role in the British Empire. But I think when we think of empire in general and the British Empire, there's this almost sort of this um, association with the, it being an English empire rather than a Scottish empire um, and that's something that we're unpicking in another one of our um, projects that we're we're working on at the moment but it's it's interesting that you know I, th I think maybe it's the British sort of uh, the the Victorian uh, front that's put on the uh, the British Empire that that maybe makes people forget what a role <laughs> Scotland played in empire so it's really interesting it's all about these markers of national identity and how they're how they're played uh, across, you know, across time. I think, you know, that idea of um, about like Bruce and Wallace used by the Victorians uh, as a as a bit of a symbol. Um, Michael, I don't know if you want to speak to speak to that. Yeah, that's that's really interesting that you brought that up, Ailey. I mean, I, I was kind of thinking about that too, and it it's almost, you know, the the kind of engine room is imperial opportunity in some ways that that pulling the Scots into participation with uh, you know with a uh, with a British state but there's a it, it's going back to what Daniel was saying too there's a kind of sense of of uh, both distinct but shared values expressed by pre-union history so 
you know, alongside Wallace and Bruce defending Scottish liberties and freedoms and the Declaration of Arbroath um, as an enunciation of those freedoms against a foreign tyrannical king, an English king, but OK, let's pass on for that. That's said alongside things like you know, Simon de Montfort, um, the development of the English Parliament, the civil wars of the 17th century from an English perspective as being against royal tyranny too. So it, it's created into a kind of both kind of parallel, but in some ways shared history of defence of freedoms, which is you know, welded together, I suppose, particularly I think in the 19th century by, by Victorian popular historians who who you know want to, to tell these stories in tandem and they'll pop from one to the other. And in a way, the purpose of that is to, I guess, create a, a kind of usable common narrative, but without really dealing with the distinctions that you might draw from that a la Braveheart, you know, that you can present that struggle that Wallace has with the English, not simply as a, a struggle against tyranny, but distinctly a struggle against English tyranny. Um, and clearly before the Union, that's exactly how the Scots tell that story. Um, and, and, you know, you can't really remove the anti-English element from Wallace's narrative. And, I, and that's that problem that the way the union has worked is by recognising Scotland's distinctive character within it. But that's meant that it's never really been an incorporating union. It's always been a union of two separate entities. Absolutely. And I think that's kind of a good note to maybe begin to draw the evening to a close with, given that we only have a couple of minutes left. I think um, it's it's something that is obviously clear in Harding's depiction of uh, Scotland and something that has clearly uh, tracked throughout throughout the centuries. Um, and the other thing, I guess, was when we spoke a little bit earlier about the idea of what museums can do with um, objects that might have this contemporary relevance, what it strikes me is just there are a multiplicity of narratives here, so many different stories that you can tell, so many different angles that you can take. And I guess part of that is that we uh, do uh, events programming like this, where we get to dive a little bit deeper into those subjects. And we have um, in a, the exhibition that opens on the 20th of February, uh, we will have uh, an exhibit uh, digital storytelling feature where you can follow John Harding on his on his, uh, his route round Scotland. So there are lots of different ways that you can engage with the topic, um, but that, uh, that just mean that we can get we can get slightly deeper into these issues that we've been we've been talking about this evening. Um, I would just like to say a massive thank you uh, to both Michael and Daniel for taking part in tonight's discussion. Uh, it should be said that Michael has been helping us uh, to curate uh, another exhibition which opens on the 20th of February, which is Cult Church City Medieval St Andrews, which is uh, promises to be a real feast for the eyes, I would say. Uh, all of these objects that are coming together from across the UK to St Andrews to be displayed together for the first time, which is so exciting. So if your uh, interests are piqued by all the medieval splendour that we've been talking about this evening, please come along and visit the exhibition from the 20th of February. But um, yeah, thank you so, so much, Daniel and Michael, for your time this evening. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Please, please come along and see the exhibition when it opens. Thank you so much. <laughs>